Science is an ongoing search for truth, a perpetual struggle to discover how the universe works that goes back to the earliest civilizations. Driven by human curiosity, it has relied on reasoning, observation and experiment. The best known of the ancient Greek philosophers, Aristotle, wrote widely on scientific subjects and laid foundations for much of the work that has followed. He was a good observer of nature, but he relied entirely on thought and argument and did no experiments. As a result, he got a number of things wrong. He asserted that big objects fall faster than little ones, for example, and that if one object had twice the weight of another, it would fall twice as fast. Although this is mistaken, no one doubted it until the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei disproved the idea in 1590. While it may seem obvious today that a good scientist must rely on empirical evidence, this was not always apparent. The Scientific Method A logical system for the scientific process was first put forward by the English philosopher Francis Bacon in the early 17th century. Building on the work of the Arab scientist Al-Hazen 600 years earlier, and soon to be reinforced by the French philosopher René Descartes, Bacon's scientific method requires scientists to make observations, form a theory to explain what is going on, and then carry out an experiment to see whether the theory works. If it seems to be true, then the results may be sent out for peer review, in which people working in the same or a similar field are invited to pick holes in the argument and so falsify the theory or to repeat the experiment to make sure that the results are correct. Making a testable hypothesis or a prediction is always useful. English astronomer Edmund Halley, observing the comet of 1682, realized that it was similar to comets reported in 1531 and 1607 and suggested that all three were the same object in orbit round the Sun. He predicted that it would return in 1758, and he was right, though only just. It was spotted on the 25th of December. Today, the comet is known as Halley's Comet. Since astronomers are rarely able to perform experiments, evidence can come only from observation. Experiments may test a theory or be purely speculative. When the New Zealand-born physicist Ernest Rutherford watched his students fire alpha particles at gold leaf in a search for small deflections, he suggested putting the detector beside the source and, to their astonishment, some of the alpha particles bounced back off the paper-thin foil. Rutherford said it was as though an artillery shell had bounced back off tissue paper, and this led him to a new idea about the structure of the atom. An experiment is all the more compelling if the scientist, while proposing a new mechanism or theory, can make a prediction about the outcome. If the experiment produces the predicted result, the scientist then has supporting evidence for the theory. Even so, science can never prove that a theory is correct. As the 20th century philosopher of science Karl Popper pointed out, it can only disprove things. Every experiment that gives predicted answers is supporting evidence, but one experiment that fails may bring an entire theory crashing down. Over the centuries, long-held concepts such as the geocentric universe, the four bodily humors, the fire element, phlogiston, and a mysterious medium called ether have all been disproved and replaced with new theories. These in turn are only theories and may yet be disproved, although in many cases this is unlikely given the evidence in their support. Progression of Ideas Science rarely proceeds in simple logical steps. Discoveries may be made simultaneously by scientists working independently, but almost every advance depends in some measure on previous work and theories. One reason for building the vast apparatus known as the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, was to search for the Higgs particle, whose existence was predicted 40 years earlier, in 1964. That prediction rested on decades of theoretical work on the structure of the atom, going back to Rutherford and the work of Danish physicist Niels Bohr in the 1920s, which depended on the discovery of the electron in 1897, which in turn depended on the discovery of cathode rays in 1869. Those could not have been found without the vacuum pump, and in 1799, the invention of the battery. 
And so the chain goes back through decades and centuries. The great English physicist Isaac Newton famously said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. He meant primarily Galileo, but he had probably also seen a copy of Alhazen's optics. The first scientists. The first philosophers with a scientific outlook were active in the ancient Greek world during the 6th and 5th centuries BCE. Thales of Miletus predicted an eclipse of the sun in 585 BCE. Pythagoras set up a mathematical school in what is now southern Italy 50 years later. And Xenophanes, after finding seashells on a mountain, reasoned that the whole earth must at one time have been covered by sea. In Sicily in the 4th century BCE, Empedocles asserted that earth, air, fire and water are the fourfold roots of everything. He also took his followers up to the volcanic crater of Mount Etna and jumped in, apparently to show he was immortal, and as a result we remember him to this day. Stargazers Meanwhile, in India, China and the Mediterranean, people try to make sense of the movements of the heavenly bodies. They made star maps, partly as navigational aids, and named stars and groups of stars. They also noted that a few traced irregular paths when viewed against the fixed stars. The Greeks called these wandering stars planets. The Chinese spotted Halley's Comet in 240 BCE and in 1054 a supernova that is now known as the Crab Nebula. House of Wisdom In the late 8th century CE, the Abbasid Caliphate set up the House of Wisdom, a magnificent library in its new capital, Baghdad. This inspired rapid advances in Islamic science and technology. Many ingenious mechanical devices were invented along with the astrolabe, a navigational device that used the positions of the stars. Alchemy flourished and techniques such as distillation appeared. Scholars at the library collected all the most important books from Greece and from India and translated them into Arabic, which is how the West later rediscovered the works of the ancients and learned of the Arabic numerals, including zero, that were imported from India. Birth of Modern Science As the monopoly of the Church over scientific truth began to weaken in the Western world, the year 1543 saw the publication of two groundbreaking books. Belgian anatomist Andreas Vesalius produced De Humani Corporis Fabrica, which described his dissections of human corpses with exquisite illustrations. In the same year, Polish physician Nicolaus Copernicus published De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, which stated firmly that the Sun is the center of the universe, overturning the Earth-centered model worked out by Ptolemy of Alexandria a millennium earlier. In 1600, English physician William Gilbert published De Magnete, in which he explained that compass needles point north because Earth itself is a magnet. He even argued that Earth's core is made of iron. In 1623, another English physician, William Harvey, described for the first time how the heart acts as a pump and drives blood around the body, thereby quashing forever earlier theories that dated back 1,400 years to the Greco-Roman physician Galen. In the 1660s, Anglo-Irish chemist Robert Boyle produced a string of books including The Skeptical Chemist, in which he defined a chemical element. This marked the birth of chemistry as a science, as distinct from the mystical alchemy from which it arose. Robert Hooke, who worked for a time as Boyle's assistant, produced the first scientific bestseller, Micrographia, in 1665. His superb fold-out illustrations of subjects such as a flea and the eye of a fly opened up a microscopic world no one had seen before. Then, in 1687, came what many view as the most important science book of all time, Isaac Newton's Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, commonly known as the Principia. His laws of motion and the principle of universal gravity form the basis for classical physics. Elements, atoms, evolution. 
In the 18th century, French chemist Antoine Lavoisier discovered the role of oxygen in combustion, discrediting the old theory of phlogiston. Soon, a host of new gases and their properties were being investigated. Thinking about the gases in the atmosphere led British meteorologist John Dalton to suggest that each element consisted of unique atoms and proposed the idea of atomic weights. Then German chemist August Kekulé developed the basis of molecular structure, while Russian inventor Dmitry Mendeleev laid out the first generally accepted periodic table of the elements. The invention of the electric battery by Alessandro Volta in Italy in 1799 opened up new fields of science, into which marched Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted and British contemporary Michael Faraday, discovering new elements and electromagnetism, which led to the invention of the electric motor. Meanwhile, the ideas of classical physics were applied to the atmosphere, the stars, the speed of light, and the nature of heat, which developed into the science of thermodynamics. Geologists studying rock strata began to reconstruct Earth's past. Paleontology became fashionable as the remains of extinct creatures began to turn up. Mary Anning, an untutored British girl, became a world-famous assembler of fossil remains. With the dinosaurs came ideas of evolution, most famously from British naturalist Charles Darwin, and new theories on the origins and ecology of life. Uncertainty and infinity. At the turn of the 20th century, a young German named Albert Einstein proposed his theory of relativity, shaking classical physics and ending the idea of an absolute time and space. New models of the atom were proposed. Light was shown to act as both a particle and a wave. And another German, Werner Heisenberg, demonstrated that the universe was uncertain. What has been most impressive about the last century, however, is how technical advances have enabled science to advance faster than ever before, leapfrogging ideas with increasing precision. Ever more powerful particle colliders revealed new fundamental units of matter. Stronger telescopes showed that the universe is expanding and started with a big bang. The idea of black holes began to take root. Dark matter and dark energy, whatever they were, seemed to fill the universe, and astronomers began to discover new worlds, planets in orbit around distant stars, some of which may even harbor life. British mathematician Alan Turing thought of the universal computing machine, and within 50 years, we had personal computers, the World Wide Web, and smartphones. Secrets of Life in biology, chromosomes were shown to be the basis of inheritance and the chemical structure of DNA was decoded. Just 40 years later, this led to the Human Genome Project, which seemed a daunting task in prospect and yet, aided by computing, got faster and faster as it progressed. DNA sequencing is now an almost routine laboratory operation. Gene therapy has moved from a hope into reality and the first mammal has been cloned. As today's scientists build on these and other achievements, the relentless search for the truth continues. It seems likely that there will always be more questions than answers, but future discoveries will surely continue to amaze. The Beginning of Science 600 BCE to 1400 CE the scientific study of the world has its roots in Mesopotamia. Following the invention of agriculture and writing, people had the time to devote to study and the means to pass the results of those studies on to the next generation. Early science was inspired by the wonder of the night sky. From the fourth millennium BCE, Sumerian priests studied the stars recording their results on clay tablets. They did not leave records of their methods but a tablet dating from 1800 BCE shows knowledge of the properties of right-angled triangles. Ancient Greece The ancient Greeks did not see science as a separate subject from philosophy, but the first figure whose work is recognizably scientific is probably Thales of Miletus, 
of whom Plato said that he spent so much time dreaming and looking at the stars that he once fell into a well. Possibly using data from earlier Babylonians in 585 BCE, Thales predicted a solar eclipse, demonstrating the power of a scientific approach. Ancient Greece was not a single country, but rather a loose collection of city-states. Miletus, now in Turkey, was the birthplace of several noted philosophers. Many other early Greek philosophers studied in Athens. Here, Aristotle was an astute observer, but he did not carry out experiments. He believed that if he could bring together enough clever men, the truth would emerge. The engineer Archimedes, who lived at Syracuse on the island of Sicily, explored the properties of fluids. A new center of learning developed at Alexandria, founded at the mouth of the Nile by Alexander the Great in 331 BCE. Here, Eratosthenes measured the size of Earth. Tisibius made accurate clocks, and Hero invented the steam engine. Meanwhile, the librarians in Alexandria collected the best books they could find to build up the best library in the world, which was burned down when Romans and Christians took over the city. Science in Asia Science flourished independently in China. The Chinese invented gunpowder, and with it fireworks, rockets and guns, and made bellows for working metal. They invented the first seismograph and the first compass. In 1054 CE, Chinese astronomers observed a supernova, which was identified as the Crab Nebula in 1731. Some of the most advanced technology in the first millennium CE, including the spinning wheel, was developed in India, and Chinese missions were sent to study Indian farming techniques. Indian mathematicians developed what we now call the Arabic number system, including negative numbers and zero, and gave definitions of the trigonometric functions sine and cosine. The Golden Age of Islam In the middle of the 8th century, the Islamic Abbasid Caliphate moved the capital of its empire from Damascus to Baghdad. Guided by the Quranic slogan, the ink of a scholar is more holy than the blood of a martyr, Caliph Harun al-Rashid founded the House of Wisdom in his new capital, intending it to be a library and center for research. Scholars collected books from the old Greek city-states and India and translated them into Arabic. This is how many of the ancient texts would eventually reach the West, where they were largely unknown in the Middle Ages. By the middle of the 9th century, the library in Baghdad had grown to become a fine successor to the library at Alexandria. Among those who were inspired by the House of Wisdom were several astronomers, notably al-Sufi, who built on the work of Hipparchus and Ptolemy. Astronomy was of practical use to Arab nomads for navigation, as they steered their camels across the desert at night. Al-Hazan, born in Basra and educated in Baghdad, was one of the first experimental scientists, and his book on optics has been likened in importance to the work of Isaac Newton. Arab alchemists devised distillation and other new techniques, and coined words such as alkali, aldehyde, and alcohol. Physician Al-Razi introduced soap, distinguished for the first time between smallpox and measles, and wrote in one of his many books, the doctor's aim is to do good even to our enemies. Al-Khwarizmi and other mathematicians invented algebra and algorithms, and engineer Al-Jazari invented the crank connecting rod system, which is still used in bicycles and cars. It would take several centuries for European scientists to catch up with these developments. In 585 BCE, Thales of Miletus predicts the eclipse of the sun that brings the Battle of Halis to an end. And in circa 530 BCE, Pythagoras founds a mathematical school at Croton in what is now southern Italy. In circa 500 BCE, Xenophanes finds seashells on mountains and reckons that the whole earth was once covered with water. In circa 450 BCE, Empedocles suggests that everything on Earth is made from combinations of Earth, air, fire, and water. 
In circa 325 BCE, Aristotle writes a string of books on subjects including physics, biology, and zoology. In circa 300 BCE, Theophrastus writes inquiry into plants and the causes of plants, founding the discipline of botany. In circa 250 BCE, Aristarchus of Samos suggests that the sun, rather than earth, is the center of the universe. And then in circa 240 BCE, Archimedes discovers that a king's crown is not pure gold by measuring the upthrust of displaced water. Also in circa 240 BCE, Eratosthenes, a friend of Archimedes, calculates the circumference of Earth from the shadows of the sun at midday on Midsummer Day. In circa 230 BCE, Tisibius builds clepsydras, water clocks, that remain for centuries the most accurate timepieces in the world. In circa 130 BCE, Hipparchus discovers the precession of Earth's orbit and compiles the Western world's first star catalogue. And in circa 120 CE, in China, Zhang Heng discusses the nature of eclipses and compiles a catalogue of 2,500 stars. In circa 150 CE, Claudius Ptolemy's Almagest becomes the authoritative text on astronomy in the West, even though it contains many errors. In the year 628, Indian mathematician Brahma Gupta outlines the first rules to use the number zero. Then in the year 964, Persian astronomer Abd al-Rahman al-Sufi updates the Almagest and gives many stars the Arabic names used today. And finally, in the year 1021, Al-Hazan, one of the first experimental scientists, conducts original research on vision and optics. Eclipses of the Sun can be predicted. Thales of Miletus, 624-546 BCE. Day became night, and this change of the day Thales the Milesian had foretold. Herodotus. Born in a Greek colony in Asia Minor, Thales of Miletus is often viewed as the founder of Western philosophy, but he was also a key figure in the early development of science. He was recognized in his lifetime for his thinking on mathematics, physics, and astronomy. Perhaps Thales's most famous achievement is also his most controversial. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, writing more than a century after the event, Thales is said to have predicted a solar eclipse, now dated to the 28th of May 585 BCE, which famously brought a battle between the warring Lydians and Medes to a halt. Contested history. Thales' achievement was not to be repeated for several centuries, and historians of science have long argued about how and even if he achieved it. Some argue that Herodotus's account is inaccurate and vague, but Thales' feat seems to have been widely known and was taken as fact by later writers who knew to treat Herodotus's word with caution. Assuming it is true, it is likely that Thales had discovered an 18-year cycle in the movements of the sun and moon, known as the Seros cycle, which was used by later Greek astronomers to predict eclipses. Whatever method Thales used, his prediction had a dramatic effect on the battle at the river Halis in modern-day Turkey. The eclipse ended not only the battle, but also a 15-year war between the Medes and the Lydians. In context, branch, astronomy, before, circa 2000 BCE, European monuments such as Stonehenge may have been used to calculate eclipses. Circa 1800 BCE. In ancient Babylon, astronomers produced the first recorded mathematical description of the movement of heavenly bodies. Second millennium BCE. Babylonian astronomers developed methods for predicting eclipses, but these are based on observations of the moon, not mathematical cycles. After. Circa 140 BCE, Greek astronomer Hipparchus 
develops a system to predict eclipses using the Seros cycle of movements of the Sun and Moon. Now hear the fourfold roots of everything. Empedocles, 490 to 430 BCE. The nature of matter concerned many ancient Greek thinkers. Having seen liquid water, solid ice and gaseous mist, Thales of Miletus believed that everything must be made of water. Aristotle suggested that nourishment of all things is moist and even the hot is created from the wet and lives by it. Writing two generations after Thales, Anaximenes suggested that the world is made of air, reasoning that when air condenses it produces mist and then rain and eventually stones. Born at Agrigentum on the island of Sicily, the physician and poet Empedocles devised a more complex theory, that everything is made of four roots. He did not use the word elements, namely earth, air, fire and water. Combining these roots would produce qualities such as heat and wetness to make earth, stone and all plants and animals. Originally, the four roots formed a perfect sphere held together by love, the centripetal force, but gradually strife, the centrifugal force, began to pull them apart. For Empedocles, love and strife are the two forces that shape the universe. In this world, strife tends to predominate, which is why life is so difficult. This relatively simple theory dominated European thought, which referred to the four humours, with little refinement until the development of modern chemistry in the 17th century. Fact. Empedocles saw the four roots of matter as two pairs of opposites, fire, water, and air, earth, which combine to produce everything we see. Fire, hot and dry. Earth, dry and cold. Water, wet and cold. Air, hot and wet. In context. Branch, chemistry, before. Circa 585 BCE, Thales suggests the whole world is made of water. Circa 535 BCE, Anaximenes thinks that everything is made from air, from which water and then stones are made. After, circa 400 BCE, the Greek thinker Democritus proposes that the world is ultimately made of tiny, indivisible particles, atoms. 1661. In his work, Skeptical Chemist, Robert Boyle provides a definition of elements. 1808. John Dalton's atomic theory states that each element has atoms of different masses. 1869. Dmitri Mendeleev proposes a periodic table, arranging the elements in groups according to their shared properties. Measuring the Circumference of Earth Eratosthenes, 276 to 194 BCE The Greek astronomer and mathematician Eratosthenes is best remembered as the first person to measure the size of Earth, but he is also regarded as the founder of geography, not only coining the word, but also establishing many of the basic principles used to measure locations on our planet. Born at Cyrene in modern-day Libya, Eratosthenes travelled widely in the Greek world, studying in Athens and Alexandria, and eventually becoming the librarian of Alexandria's great library. It was in Alexandria that Eratosthenes heard a report that at the town of Swenet, south of Alexandria, the sun passed directly overhead on the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, when the sun rises highest in the sky. Assuming the sun was so distant that its rays were almost parallel to each other when they hit Earth, he used a vertical rod, or gnomon, to project the sun's shadow at the same moment in Alexandria. Here, he determined, the sun was 7.2 degrees south of the zenith, which is one-fiftieth of the circumference of a circle. Therefore, he reasoned, the separation of the two cities along a north-south meridian must be one-fiftieth of Earth's circumference, 
This allowed him to work out the size of our planet at 230,000 stadia, or 39,690 kilometers, or 24,662 miles, an error of less than 2%. Fact. Sunlight reached Swenet at right angles, but cast a shadow at Alexandria. The angle of the shadow cast by the gnomon allowed Eratosthenes to calculate Earth's circumference. In context. Branch. Geography. Before. 6th century BCE. Greek mathematician Pythagoras suggests Earth may be spherical, not flat. 3rd century BCE. Aristarchus of Samos is the first to place the Sun at the center of the known universe and uses a trigonometric method to estimate the relative sizes of the Sun and the Moon and their distances from Earth. Late 3rd century BCE, Eratosthenes introduces the concepts of parallels and meridians to his maps, equivalent to modern longitude and latitude. After 18th century, the true circumference and shape of Earth is found through enormous efforts by French and Spanish scientists. The human is related to the lower beings. Altusi, 1201-1274 The organisms that can gain the new features faster are more variable. As a result, they gain advantages over other creatures. Altusi a Persian scholar born in Baghdad in 1201, during the Golden Age of Islam, Nazir al-Din al-Tusi, was a poet, philosopher, mathematician and astronomer, and one of the first to propose a system of evolution. He suggested that the universe had once comprised identical elements that had gradually drifted apart, with some becoming minerals and others changing more quickly, developing into plants and animals. In Akhloch in Nazari, Altusi's work on ethics, he set out a hierarchy of life forms in which animals were higher than plants and humans were higher than other animals. He regarded the conscious will of animals as a step towards the consciousness of humans. Animals are able to move consciously to search for food and can learn new things. In this ability to learn, Altusi saw an ability to reason. The trained horse or hunting falcon is at a higher point of development in the animal world, he said, adding, the first steps of human perfection begin from here. Altusi believed that organisms changed over time, seeing in that change a progression towards perfection. He thought of humans as being on a middle step of the evolutionary stairway, potentially able by means of their will to reach a higher developmental level. He was the first to suggest that not only do organisms change over time, but that the whole range of life has evolved from a time when there was no life at all. In context. Branch. Biology. Before. Circa 550 BCE. Anaximander of Miletus proposes that animal life began in the water and evolved from there. Circa 340 BCE. Plato's theory of forms argues that species are unchangeable. Circa 300 BCE, Epicurus says that many other species have been created in the past, but only the most successful survive to have offspring. After 1377, Ibn Khaldun writes in Mukaddima that humans developed from monkeys. 1809, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposes a theory of evolution of species. 1858, Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin suggest a theory of evolution by means of natural selection. A floating object displaces its own volume in liquid. Archimedes, 287 to 212 BCE. A solid heavier than a fluid will, if placed in it, descend to the bottom of the fluid, and the solid will, when weighed in the fluid, be lighter than its true weight by the weight of the fluid displaced. Archimedes The Roman author Vitruvius, writing in the 1st century BCE, 
recounts the possibly apocryphal story of an incident that happened two centuries earlier. Hieron II, the king of Sicily, had ordered a new gold crown. When the crown was delivered, Hieron suspected that the crown maker had substituted silver for some of the gold, melting the silver with the remaining gold so that the color looked the same as pure gold. The king asked his chief scientist, Archimedes, to investigate. Archimedes puzzled over the problem. The new crown was precious and must not be damaged in any way. He went to the public baths in Syracuse to ponder the problem. The bath was full to the brim, and when he climbed in, he noticed two things. The water level rose, making some water slop over the side, and he felt weightless. He shouted, Eureka! I have found the answer, and ran home stark naked. Measuring Volume Archimedes had realized that if he lowered the crown into a bucket brimful with water, it would displace some water, exactly the same amount as its own volume, and he could measure how much water spilled out. This would tell him the volume of the crown. Silver is less dense than gold, so a silver crown of the same weight would be bigger than a gold crown and would displace more water. Therefore, an adulterated crown would displace more water than a pure gold crown, and more than a lump of gold of the same weight. In practice, the effect would have been small and difficult to measure, but Archimedes had also realized that any object immersed in a liquid experiences an upthrust, upwards force, equal to the weight of the liquid it has displaced. Archimedes probably solved the puzzle by hanging the crown and an equal weight of pure gold on opposite ends of a stick, which he then suspended by its center so that the two weights balanced. Then he lowered the whole thing into a bath of water. If the crown was pure gold, it and the lump of gold would experience an equal upthrust, and the stick would stay horizontal. If the crown contained some silver, however, the volume of the crown would be greater than the volume of the lump of gold. The crown would displace more water, and the stick would tilt sharply. Archimedes' idea became known as Archimedes' Principle, which states that the upthrust on an object in a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid the object displaces. This principle explains how objects made of dense material can still float on water. A steel ship that weighs one ton will sink until it has displaced one ton of water, but then will sink no further. Its deep, hollow hull has a greater volume and displaces more water than a lump of steel of the same weight and is therefore buoyed up by a greater upthrust. Vitruvius tells us that Hieron's crown was indeed found to contain some silver and that the crown maker was duly punished. Biography Archimedes Archimedes was possibly the greatest mathematician in the ancient world. Born around 287 BCE, he was killed by a soldier when his hometown, Syracuse, was taken by the Romans in 212 BCE. He had devised several fearsome weapons to keep at bay the Roman warships that attacked Syracuse. A catapult, a crane to lift the bows of a ship out of the water, and a death array of mirrors to focus the sun's rays and set fire to a ship. He probably invented the Archimedes screw, still used today for irrigation, during a stay in Egypt. Archimedes also calculated an approximation for pi, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, and wrote down the laws of levers and pulleys. The achievement Archimedes was most proud of was a mathematical proof that the smallest cylinder that any given sphere can fit into has exactly 1.5 times the sphere's volume. A sphere and a cylinder are carved into Archimedes's tombstone. Key work. Circa 250 BCE on floating bodies. Overview of ideas. Silver is less dense than gold, so a lump of silver will have a greater volume than a lump of gold of the same weight. A crown made partly of silver will have greater volume and displace more water than a lump of pure gold of the same weight as the crown. The displaced water causes an upthrust. The partly silver crown experiences a greater upthrust than the gold. 
The difference in upthrust between the two is small, but it can be detected if you hang them on a balance in water. Eureka! In context. Branch. Physics. Before. Third millennium BCE. Metal workers discover that melting metals and mixing them together produces an alloy that is stronger than either of the original metals. 600 BCE. In ancient Greece, coins are made from an alloy of gold and silver called electrum. After. 1687. In his Principia Mathematica, Isaac Newton outlines his theory of gravity, explaining how there is a force that pulls everything towards the centre of Earth, and vice versa. 1738. Swiss mathematician Daniel Bernoulli develops his kinetic theory of fluids, explaining how fluids exert pressure on objects by the random movement of molecules in the fluid. The sun is like fire, the moon is like water. Zhang Heng, 78 to 139 CE. The moon and the planets are yin, they have shape, but no light. Jing Fang. In about 140 BCE, the Greek astronomer Hipparchus, probably the finest astronomer of the ancient world, compiled a catalogue of some 850 stars. He also explained how to predict the movements of the sun and moon and the dates of eclipses. In his work Almagest of about 150 CE, Ptolemy of Alexandria listed 1,000 stars and 48 constellations. Most of this work was effectively an updated version of what Hipparchus had written, but in a more practical form. In the West, the Almagest became the standard astronomy text throughout the Middle Ages. Its tables included all the information needed to calculate the future positions of the Sun and Moon, the planets and the major stars, and also eclipses of the Sun and Moon. In 120 CE, the Chinese polymath Zhang Heng produced a work entitled Ling Shan, or The Spiritual Constitution of the Universe. In it, he wrote that the sky is like a hen's egg, and is as round as a crossbow pellet, and the earth is like the yolk of the egg, lying alone at the centre. The sky is large and the earth small. This was, following Hipparchus and Ptolemy, a universe with earth at its centre. Zhang catalogued 2,500 brightly shining stars and 124 constellations, and added that of the very small stars, there are 11,520. Eclipses of the Moon and Planets Zhang was fascinated by eclipses. He wrote, The sun is like fire and the moon like water. The fire gives out light and the water reflects it. Thus the moon's brightness is produced from the radiance of the sun, and the moon's darkness is due to the light of the sun being obstructed. The side that faces the sun is fully lit, and the side that is away from it is dark. Zhang also described a lunar eclipse where the sun's light cannot reach the moon because Earth is in the way. He recognized that the planets were also like water, reflecting light, and so were also subject to eclipses. When a similar effect happens with a planet, we call it an occultation. When the moon passes across the sun's path, then there is a solar eclipse. In the 11th century, another Chinese astronomer, Shen Kuo, expanded on Zhang's work in one significant respect. He showed that observations of the waxing and waning of the moon proved that the celestial bodies were spherical. Biography Zhang Heng Zhang Heng was born in 78 CE in the town of Xie, in what is now Henan province, in Han Dynasty, China. At 17, he left home to study literature and trained to be a writer. By his late twenties, Zhang had become a skilled mathematician and was called to the court of Emperor Anti, who in 115 CE made him chief astrologer. Zhang lived at a time of rapid advances in science. As well as his astronomical work, he devised a water-powered armillary sphere a model of the celestial objects, and invented the world's first seismometer 
which was ridiculed until in 138 CE, it successfully recorded an earthquake 400 kilometers or 250 miles away. He also invented the first odometer to measure distances traveled in vehicles and a non-magnetic south-pointing compass in the form of a chariot. Zhang was a distinguished poet whose works give us vivid insights into the cultural life of his day. Key Works Circa 120 CE, The Spiritual Constitution of the Universe Also circa 120 CE, The Map of the Lingshan Overview of Ideas During the day, Earth is bright with shadows because of sunlight. The moon is sometimes bright with shadows. The moon must be bright because of sunlight. Therefore, the sun is like fire, the moon like water. Fact. Zhang's observations led him to conclude that, like the moon, the planets did not produce their own light. In context. Branch. Physics. Before. 140 BCE, Hipparchus works out how to predict eclipses. 150 CE, Ptolemy improves on Hipparchus's work and produces practical tables for calculating the future positions of the celestial bodies. After, the 11th century, Shen Kuo writes the Dream Pool essays in which he uses the waxing and waning of the moon to demonstrate that all heavenly bodies, though not Earth, are spherical. 1543. Nicolaus Copernicus publishes On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres, in which he describes a heliocentric system. 1609. Johannes Kepler explains the movements of the planets as free-floating bodies describing ellipses. Light travels in straight lines into our eyes. Alhazen, circa 965 to 1040. The duty of the man who investigates the writings of scientists, if learning the truth is his goal, is to make himself an enemy of all that he reads. Alhazen. The Arab astronomer and mathematician Alhazen, who lived in Baghdad in present day Iraq during the golden age of Islamic civilization, was arguably the world's first experimental scientist. While earlier Greek and Persian thinkers had explained the natural world in various ways, they had arrived at their conclusions through abstract reasoning, not through physical experiments. Alhazen, working in a thriving Islamic culture of curiosity and inquiry, was the first to use what we now call the scientific method, setting up hypotheses and methodically testing them with experiments. As he observed, the seeker after truth is not one who studies the writings of the ancients and puts his trust in them, but rather the one who suspects his faith in them and questions what he gathers from them, the one who submits to argument and demonstration. Understanding Vision Alhazen is remembered today as a founder of the science of optics. His most important works were studies of the structure of the eye and the process of vision. The Greek scholars Euclid and later Ptolemy believed that vision derived from rays that beamed out of the eye and bounced back from whatever a person was looking at. Alhazen showed through the observation of shadows and reflection that light bounces off objects and travels in straight lines into our eyes. Vision was a passive rather than an active phenomenon, at least until it reached the retina. He noted that from each point of every colored body, illuminated by any light, issue light and color along every straight line that can be drawn from that point. In order to see things, we have only to open our eyes to let in the light. There is no need for the eye to send out rays, even if it could. Alhazen also found, through his experiments with bull's eyes, that light enters a small hole, the pupil, and is focused by a lens onto a sensitive surface, the retina, at the back of the eye. However, even though he recognized the eye as a lens, he did not explain how the eye or the brain forms an image. Experiments with Light Alhazen's monumental seven-volume Book of Optics 
set out his theory of light and his theory of vision. It remained the main authority on the subject until Newton's Principia was published 650 years later. The book explores the interaction of light with lenses and describes the phenomenon of refraction, change in the direction of light, 700 years before Dutch scientist Willebrod van Rooyen Snell's Law of Refraction. It also examines the refraction of light by the atmosphere and describes shadows, rainbows and eclipses. Optics greatly influenced later Western scientists, including Francis Bacon, one of the scientists responsible for reviving Alhazen's scientific method during the Renaissance in Europe. Biography Alhazen Abu Ali al Hassan ibn al Haytham, known in the West as Al Hazen, was born in Basra in present day Iraq and educated in Baghdad. As a young man, he was given a government job in Basra, but soon became bored. One story has it that on hearing about the problems resulting from the annual flooding of the Nile in Egypt, he wrote to Caliph al-Hakim, offering to build a dam to regulate the deluge, and was received with honor in Cairo. However, when he traveled south of the city and saw the sheer size of the river, which is almost 1.6 kilometers or one mile wide at Aswan, he realized the task was impossible with the technology then available. To avoid the Caliph's retribution, he feigned insanity and remained under house arrest for 12 years. In that time, he did his most important work. Key Works, 1011 to 21, Book of Optics. Circa 1030, A Discourse on Light. Circa 1030, On the Light of the Moon. Overview of Ideas. The light of the sun bounces off objects. The light bounces off in straight lines. To see, we need do nothing but open our eyes. Light travels in straight lines into our eyes. Fact. Alhazen provided the first scientific description of a camera obscura, an optical device that projects an upside down image on a screen. In context, branch, physics, before 350 BCE, Aristotle argues that vision derives from physical forms entering the eye from an object. 300 BCE, Euclid argues that the eye sends out beams that are bounced back to the eye. 980s, Ibn Sal investigates refraction of light and deduces the laws of refraction. After 1240, English Bishop Robert Grosstest uses geometry in his experiments with optics and accurately describes the nature of color. 1604, Johannes Kepler's theory of the retinal image is based directly on Alhazen's work. 1620s, Alhazen's ideas influence Francis Bacon, who advocates a scientific method based on experiment. Scientific Revolution, 1400 to 1700. The Islamic Golden Age was a great flowering of the sciences and arts that began in the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate, Baghdad, in the mid eighth century and lasted for about 500 years. It laid the foundations for experimentation and the modern scientific method. In the same period in Europe, however, several hundred years were to pass before scientific thought was to overcome the restrictions of religious dogma. Dangerous thinking. For centuries, the Catholic Church's view of the universe was based on Aristotle's idea that Earth was at the orbital center of all celestial bodies. Then, in about 1532, after years of struggling with its complex mathematics, Polish physician Nicolaus Copernicus completed his heretical model of the universe that had the sun at its center. Aware of the heresy, he was careful to state that it was only a mathematical model, and he waited until he was on the point of death before publishing, but the Copernican model quickly won many advocates. German astrologer Johannes Kepler refined Copernicus's theory using observations by his Danish mentor Tycho Brahe and calculated that the orbits of Mars and, by inference, the other planets were ellipses. Improved telescopes allowed Italian polymath 
Galileo Galilei to identify four moons of Jupiter in 1610. The new cosmology's explanatory power was becoming undeniable. Galileo also demonstrated the power of scientific experiment, investigating the physics of falling objects and devising the pendulum as an effective timekeeper which Dutchman Christian Huygens used to build the first pendulum clock in 1657. English philosopher Francis Bacon wrote two books laying out his ideas for a scientific method and the theoretical groundwork for modern science, based on experiment, observation and measurement, was developed. New discoveries followed thick and fast. Robert Boyle used an air pump to investigate the properties of air, while Huygens and English physicist Isaac Newton came up with opposing theories of how light travels, establishing the science of optics. Danish astronomer Ola Roemer noticed discrepancies in the timetable of eclipses of the moons of Jupiter and used these to calculate an approximate value for the speed of light. Roemer's compatriot, Bishop Nicholas Steno, was skeptical of much ancient wisdom and developed his own ideas in both anatomy and geology. He laid down the principles of stratigraphy, the study of rock layers, establishing a new scientific basis for geology. Micro worlds. Throughout the 17th century, developments in technology drove scientific discovery at the smallest scale. In the early 1600s, Dutch spectacle makers developed the first microscopes, and later that century, Robert Hooke built his own and made beautiful drawings of his findings, revealing the intricate structure of tiny bugs such as fleas for the first time. Dutch draper Antony van Leeuwenhoek, perhaps inspired by Hooke's drawings, made hundreds of his own microscopes and found tiny life forms in places where no one had thought of looking before, such as water. Leeuwenhoek had discovered single-celled life forms such as protists and bacteria, which he called animalcules. When he reported his findings to the British Royal Society, they sent three priests to certify that he had really seen such things. Dutch microscopist Jan Swammerdam showed that egg, larva, pupa and adult are all stages in the development of an insect and not separate animals created by God. Old ideas dating back to Aristotle were swept away by these new discoveries. Meanwhile, English biologist John Ray compiled an enormous encyclopedia of plants, which marked the first serious attempt at systematic classification. Mathematical Analysis Heralding the Enlightenment, these discoveries laid the groundwork for the modern scientific disciplines of astronomy, chemistry, geology, physics and biology. The century's crowning achievement came with Newton's treatise Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which laid out his laws of motion and gravity. Newtonian physics was to remain the best description of the physical world for more than two centuries, and together with the analytical techniques of calculus developed independently by Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, it would provide a powerful tool for future scientific study. In 1543, Nicolaus Copernicus publishes De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, outlining a heliocentric universe. Then in 1600, astronomer William Gilbert publishes De Magnete, a treatise on magnetism, and suggests that Earth is a magnet. In 1609, Johannes Kepler suggests that Mars has an elliptical orbit. In 1610, Galileo observes the moons of Jupiter and experiments with balls rolling down slopes. In the 1620s, Francis Bacon publishes Novum Organum Scientarium and the New Atlantis, outlining the scientific method. In 1639, Jeremiah Horrocks observes the transit of Venus. And in 1643, Evangelista Torricelli invents the barometer. In the 1660s, Robert Boyle publishes New Experiments Physico-Mechanical, touching the spring of the air and its effects, investigating air pressure. In 1665, in Micrographia, Robert Hooke introduces the world to the anatomy of fleas, bees, and cork. In 1669, 
Nicholas Steno writes about solids, fossils and crystals, contained within solids. Also in 1669, Jan Swammerdam describes how insects develop in stages in Historia Insectorum Generalis. In the 1670s, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek observes single-celled organisms, sperm and even bacteria with simple microscopes. In 1676, Ola Roma uses the moons of Jupiter to show that light has a finite speed. In 1678, Christian Huygens first announces his wave theory of light, which will later contrast with Isaac Newton's idea of light as corpuscular. In 1686, John Ray publishes Historia Plantarum, an encyclopedia of the plant kingdom. And finally, in 1687, Isaac Newton outlines his laws of motion in Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica. At the center of everything is the sun. Nicolaus Copernicus, 1473 to 1543. If the Lord Almighty had consulted me before embarking on creation thus, I should have recommended something simpler. Alfonso X, King of Castile. Since the sun remains stationary, whatever appears as a motion of the sun is due to the motion of the earth. Nicolaus Copernicus As though seated on a royal throne, the sun governs the family of planets revolving around it. Nicolaus Copernicus Throughout its early history, Western thought was shaped by an idea of the universe that placed earth at the center of everything. This geocentric model seemed at first to be rooted in everyday observations and common sense. We do not feel any motion of the ground on which we stand, and superficially there seems to be no observational evidence that our planet is in motion either. Surely the simplest explanation was that the sun, moon, planets and stars were all spinning around Earth at different rates. This system appears to have been widely accepted in the ancient world, and became entrenched in classical philosophy through the works of Plato and Aristotle in the 4th century BCE. However, when the ancient Greeks measured the movements of the planets, it became clear that the geocentric system had problems. The orbits of the known planets, five wandering lights in the sky, followed complex paths. Mercury and Venus were always seen in the morning and evening skies, describing tight loops around the sun. Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, meanwhile, took 780 days, 12 years and 30 years respectively, to circle against the background stars, their motion complicated by retrograde loops in which they slowed and temporarily reversed the general direction of their motion. Ptolemaic system To explain these complications, Greek astronomers introduced the idea of epicycles, sub-orbits around which the planet circled as the central pivot points of the sub-orbits were carried around the Sun. This system was best refined by the great Greco-Roman astronomer and geographer Ptolemy of Alexandria in the second century CE. Even in the classical world, however, there were differences of opinion. The Greek thinker Aristarchus of Samos, for instance, used ingenious trigonometric measurements to calculate the relative distances of the Sun and Moon in the 3rd century BCE. He found that the Sun was huge, and this inspired him to suggest that the Sun was a more likely pivot point for the motion of the cosmos. However, the Ptolemaic system ultimately won out over rival theories, with far-reaching implications. While the Roman Empire dwindled in subsequent centuries, the Christian Church inherited many of its assumptions. The idea that Earth was the center of everything and that man was the pinnacle of God's creation with dominion over Earth became a central tenet of Christianity and held sway in Europe until the 16th century. However, this does not mean that astronomy stagnated for a millennium and a half after Ptolemy. The ability to accurately predict the movements of the planets was not only a scientific and philosophical puzzle, but also had supposed practical purposes, thanks to the superstitions of astrology. Stargazers of all persuasions had good reason to attempt ever more accurate measurement of the motions of the planets. Arabic scholarship. 
The later centuries of the first millennium corresponded with the first great flowering of Arabic science. The rapid spread of Islam across the Middle East and North Africa from the 7th century brought Arab thinkers into contact with classical texts, including the astronomical writings of Ptolemy and others. The practice of positional astronomy, calculating the positions of heavenly bodies, reached its apogee in Spain, which had become a dynamic melting pot of Islamic, Jewish and Christian thought. In the late 13th century, King Alfonso X of Castile sponsored the compilation of the Alphonsine Tables, which combined new observations with centuries of Islamic records to bring new precision to the Ptolemaic system and provide the data that would be used to calculate planetary positions until the early 17th century. Questioning Ptolemy However, by this point, the Ptolemaic model was becoming absurdly complicated, with yet further epicycles added to keep prediction in line with observation. In 1377, French philosopher Nicole Orem, Bishop of Lisieux, addressed this problem head-on in the work Livre du ciel et du monde, Book of the Heavens and the Earth. He demonstrated the lack of observational proof that Earth was static, and argued that there was no reason to suppose that it was not in motion. Yet, despite his demolition of the evidence for the Ptolemaic system, Orem concluded that he did not himself believe in a moving Earth. By the beginning of the 16th century, the situation had become very different. The twin forces of the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation saw many old religious dogmas opened up to question. It was in this context that Nicolaus Copernicus, a Polish Catholic canon from the province of Varmia, put forward the first modern heliocentric theory, shifting the center of the universe from Earth to the Sun. Copernicus first published his ideas in a short pamphlet known as the Commentariolus, circulated among friends from around 1514. His theory was similar in essence to the system proposed by Aristarchus, and while it overcame many of the earlier model's failings, it remained deeply attached to certain pillars of Ptolemaic thought, most significantly the idea that the orbits of celestial objects were mounted on crystalline spheres that rotated in perfect circular motion. As a result, Copernicus had to introduce epicycles of his own in order to regulate the speed of planetary motions on certain parts of their orbits. One important implication of his model was that it vastly increased the size of the universe. If Earth was moving around the Sun, then this should give itself away through parallax effects caused by our changing point of view. The stars should appear to shift back and forth across the sky throughout the year. Because they do not do so, they must be very far away indeed. The Copernican model soon proved itself far more accurate than any refinement of the old Ptolemaic system, and word spread among intellectual circles across Europe. Notice even reached Rome, where contrary to popular belief, the model was at first welcomed in some Catholic circles. The new model caused enough of a stir for German mathematician Georg Joachim Reticus to travel to Varmia and become Copernicus's pupil and assistant from 1539. It was Reticus who published the first widely circulated account of the Copernican system, known as the Neuratio Prima, in 1540. Reticus urged the aging priest to publish his own work in full, something that Copernicus had contemplated for many years, but only conceded to in 1543 as he lay on his deathbed. Mathematical Tool Published posthumously, De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, was not initially greeted with outrage, even though any suggestion that Earth was in motion directly contradicted several passages of Scripture, and was therefore regarded as heretical by both Catholic and Protestant theologians. To sidestep the issue, a preface had been inserted that explained the heliocentric model as purely a mathematical tool for prediction, not a description of the physical universe. In his life, however, Copernicus himself had shown no such reservations. Despite its heretical implications, the Copernican model was used for the calculations involved in the great calendar reform introduced by Pope Gregory XIII in 1582. However, new problems with the model's predictive accuracy soon began to emerge, thanks to the meticulous observations of the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. 
1546 to 1601, which showed that the Copernican model did not adequately describe planetary motions. Brahe attempted to resolve these contradictions with a model of his own in which the planets went around the Sun, but the Sun and Moon remained in orbit around Earth. The real solution, that of elliptical orbits, would only be found by his pupil, Johannes Kepler. It would be six decades before Copernicanism became truly emblematic of the split caused in Europe by the reformation of the Church, thanks largely to the controversy surrounding Italian scientist Galileo Galilei. Galileo's 1610 observations of the phases displayed by Venus and the presence of moons orbiting Jupiter convinced him that the heliocentric theory was correct, and his ardent support for it from the heart of Catholic Italy was ultimately expressed in his Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, 1632. This led Galileo into conflict with the papacy, one result of which was the retrospective censorship of controversial passages in De Revolutionibus in 1616. This prohibition would not be lifted for more than two centuries. Biography Nicolaus Copernicus Born in the Polish city of Torunje in 1473, Nicolaus Copernicus was the youngest of four children of a wealthy merchant. His father died when Nicolaus was ten. An uncle took him under his wing and oversaw his education at the University of Krakow. He spent several years in Italy studying medicine and law, returning in 1503 to Poland, where he joined the canonry under his uncle, who was now Prince Bishop of Warmia. Copernicus was a master of both languages and mathematics, translating several important works and developing ideas about economics, as well as working on his astronomical theories. The theory he outlined in De Revolutionibus was daunting in its mathematical complexity. So while many recognized its significance, it was not widely adopted by astronomers for practical everyday use. Key Works 1514 Commentariolus 1543 De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, on the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. Overview of Ideas Earth appears to be stationary, with the Sun, Moon, planets and stars orbiting it. However, a model of the universe with Earth at its center cannot describe the movement of the planets without using a very complicated system. Placing the Sun at the center produces a far more elegant model, with Earth and the planets orbiting the Sun and the stars a huge distance away. At the center of everything is the Sun. Fact. Ptolemy's model of the universe has Earth unmoving at the center, with the Sun, Moon and the five known planets following circular orbits around it. To make their orbits agree with observations, Ptolemy added smaller epicycles to each planet's movement. Fact. As Earth moves around the Sun, the apparent position of stars at different distances changes due to an effect called parallax. As the stars are so far away, the effect is small and can only be detected using telescopes. In context. Branch. Astronomy. Before. 3rd century BCE. In a work called The Sand Reckoner, Archimedes reports the ideas of Aristarchus of Samos, who proposed that the universe was much larger than commonly believed, and that the sun was at its center. 150 CE. Ptolemy of Alexandria uses mathematics to describe a geocentric, or Earth-centered, model of the universe. After. 1609. Johannes Kepler resolves the outstanding conflicts in the heliocentric, or sun-centered, model of the solar system by proposing elliptical orbits. 1610. After observing the moons of Jupiter, Galileo becomes convinced that Copernicus was right. The orbit of every planet is an ellipse. Johannes Kepler, 1571-1630. While the work of Nicolaus Copernicus on celestial orbits, published in 1543, made a convincing case for a heliocentric or sun-centered model of the universe, his system suffered from significant problems. 
Unable to break free from ancient ideas that heavenly bodies were mounted on crystal spheres, Copernicus had stated that the planets orbited the sun on perfect circular paths and was forced to introduce a variety of complications to his model to account for their irregularities. Supernova and Comets In the latter half of the 16th century, Danish nobleman Tycho Brahe, 1546-1601, made observations that would prove vital to resolving the problems. A bright supernova explosion seen in the constellation of Cassiopeia in 1572 undermined the Copernican idea that the universe beyond the planets was unchanging. In 1577, Brahe plotted the motion of a comet. Comets had been thought of as local phenomena closer than the moon, but Brahe's observations showed that the comet must lie well beyond the moon and was in fact moving among the planets. At a stroke, this evidence demolished the idea of heavenly spheres. However, Brahe remained wedded to the idea of circular orbits in his geocentric or Earth-centered model. In 1597, Brahe was invited to Prague, where he spent his last years as imperial mathematician to Emperor Rudolf II. Here he was joined by German astrologer Johannes Kepler, who continued Brahe's work after his death. Breaking with circles Kepler had already begun to calculate a new orbit for Mars from Brahe's observations, and around this time concluded that its orbit must be ovoid or egg-shaped, rather than truly circular. Kepler formulated a heliocentric model with ovoid orbits, but this still did not match the observational data. In 1605, he concluded that Mars must instead orbit the Sun in an ellipse, a stretched circle with the Sun as one of two focus points. In his Astronomia Nova, New Astronomy of 1609, he outlined two laws of planetary motion. The first law stated that the orbit of every planet is an ellipse. The second law stated that a line joining a planet to the Sun sweeps across equal areas during equal periods of time. This means that the speed of the planets increases the nearer they are to the Sun. A third law in 1619 described the relationship of a planet's year to its distance from the Sun. The square of a planet's orbital period, or year, is proportional to the cube of its distance from the Sun. So, a planet that is twice the distance from the Sun than another planet will have a year that is almost three times as long. The nature of the force keeping the planets in orbit was unknown. Kepler believed it was magnetic, but it would be 1687 before Newton showed that it was gravity. Biography Johannes Kepler Born in the city of Weildestadt near Stuttgart, southern Germany in 1571, Johannes Kepler witnessed the Great Comet of 1577 as a small child, marking the start of his fascination with the heavens. While studying at the University of Tübingen, he developed a reputation as a brilliant mathematician and astrologer. He corresponded with various leading astronomers of the time, including Tycho Brahe, ultimately moving to Prague in 1600 to become Brahe's student and academic heir. Following Brahe's death in 1601, Kepler took on the post of imperial mathematician with a royal commission to complete Brahe's work on the so-called Rudolphine Tables for predicting the movements of the planets. He completed this work in Linz, Austria, where he worked from 1612 until his death in 1630. Key Works 1596 – The Cosmic Mystery 1609 – Astronomia Nova New Astronomy. 1619, The Harmony of the World. 1627, Rudolphine Tables. Overview of Ideas. The birth of a new star in a constellation shows that the heavens beyond the planets are not unchanging. Observations of comets show that they move among the planets, crossing their orbits. This suggests that heavenly bodies are not attached to fixed celestial spheres. If the planets are not fixed onto spheres, an elliptical orbit around the Sun best explains their observed motion. The orbit of every planet is an ellipse. Fact. Kepler's laws 
state that planets follow elliptical orbits with the Sun as one of the two foci of the ellipse. In any given time, a line joining the planets to the Sun sweeps across equal areas in the ellipse. In context, Branch, Astronomy, before 150 CE, Ptolemy of Alexandria publishes the Almagest, a model of the universe built on the assumption that Earth lies at its centre and the Sun, Moon, planets and stars revolve around it in circular orbits on fixed celestial spheres. 16th century. The idea of a Sun-centred cosmology begins to gain followers through the ideas of Nicolaus Copernicus. After 1639, Jeremiah Horrocks uses Kepler's ideas to predict and view a transit of Venus across the face of the Sun. 1687. Isaac Newton's laws of motion and gravitation reveal the physical principles that give rise to Kepler's laws. A falling body accelerates uniformly. Galileo Galilei, 1564 to 1642. Count what is countable, measure what is measurable, and what is not measurable, make it measurable. Galileo Galilei For 2,000 years, few people challenged Aristotle's assertion that an external force keeps things moving and that heavy objects fall faster than lighter ones. Only in the 17th century did the Italian astronomer and mathematician Galileo Galilei insist that the ideas had to be tested. He devised experiments to test how and why objects move and stop moving, and was the first to work out the principle of inertia, that objects resist a change in motion and need a force to start moving, speed up or slow down. By timing objects falling, Galileo showed that the rate of fall is the same for all objects and came to realize the part played by friction in slowing them down. With the equipment available during the 1630s, Galileo could not directly measure the speed or acceleration of freely falling objects. By rolling balls down one ramp and up another, he showed that the speed of a ball at the bottom of the ramp depended on its starting height, not on the steepness of the ramp and that a ball would always roll up to the same height it had started from, no matter how steep or shallow the inclines were. Galileo carried out his remaining experiments with a ramp, 5 metres or 16 feet long, lined with a smooth material to reduce friction. For timing, he used a large container of water with a small pipe in the bottom. He collected the water during the interval he was measuring and weighed the water collected. By letting the ball go at different points on the ramp, he showed that the distance travelled depended on the square of the time taken. In other words, the ball accelerated down the ramp. The Law of Falling Bodies Galileo's conclusion was that bodies all fall at the same speed in a vacuum, an idea later developed further by Isaac Newton. There is a greater force from gravity on a larger mass, but the larger mass also needs a bigger force to make it accelerate. The two effects cancel each other out, so in the absence of any other forces, all falling objects will accelerate at the same rate. We see things falling at different rates in everyday life because of the effect of air resistance, which slows objects down at different rates depending on their size and shape. A beach ball and a bowling ball of the same size will initially accelerate at the same rate. Once they are moving, the same amount of air resistance will act on them, but the size of this force will be a much greater proportion of the downwards force on the beach ball than the bowling ball, and so the beach ball will slow down more. Galileo's insistence on testing theories with careful observation and measurable experiments marks him, like Alhazen, as one of the founders of modern science. His ideas on forces and motion pave the way for Newton's laws of motion 50 years later and underpin our understanding of movement in the universe from atoms to galaxies. Biography Galileo Galilei Galileo was born in Pisa but later moved with his family to Florence. In 1581, he enrolled in the University of Pisa to study medicine, then switched to mathematics and natural philosophy. 
He investigated many areas of science and is perhaps most famous for his discovery of the four largest moons of Jupiter, still called the Galilean moons. Galileo's observations led him to support the sun-centered model of the solar system, which at the time was in opposition to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. In 1633, he was tried and made to recant this and other ideas. He was sentenced to house arrest, which lasted the rest of his life. During his confinement, he wrote a book summarizing his work on kinematics, the science of movement. Key Works, 1623, the Assayer. 1632, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. 1638, Discourses and Mathematical Demonstrations Relating to Two New Sciences. 